thankful to be here this morning. When I was anticipating my visit to Reading, this was not in my plans. <laughs> my prayer for this service and for this preacher is in the first words of that hymn, Come Thou Fount. Come thou fount of every blessing. Without that, it's all vain. I met some of you who don't know you. <laughs> it's interesting, I traveled for many years different churches all over, mostly the West. And I, I faced all sorts of congregations. And I used to, used to try to analyze the congregation by the way they looked. <laughs> I gave that up quickly. But it, it's interesting because when the congregation are the Lord's people, there's a kindred spirit. And it, it's usually not too difficult to recognize. So I'm thankful that here in Reading on this morning, I have a congregation of kindred spirits. <coughs> Excuse me. I've had on my mind ever since Dave mentioned a certain, a series of subjects. I don't normally preach that way. I'm, I'm more of a topical preacher. But I believe that what I, if the Lord blesses me with what I preach this morning, will not only be instructive, but it will be inspirational. Preaching ought to con those elements. There should be conviction. Uh, there should be exhortation. But, and there should be motivation, but there also needs to be with instruction. There needs to be some preaching that is inspirational. I want to introduce you from the Scripture to a group of people that come up all over again, especially I'm dealing in the New Testament this morning. But they're, they're there. You find them on many pages. And they're a distinct group. The, the church was first called Christians at Antioch. They've had many names, believer, children of God, faithful, and so on. One name that is uh, pretty much devoid today of believers is the elect of God. Back when I traveled in the late 60s and 70s, early 70s, uh, most Baptist churches I preached at would not allow you to even use that word. But I've got a group with another name. And I think that if the Lord blesses me, you'll like to be part of that group. I've never in my almost 60 years of preaching ever heard another preacher preach on this. I've never read anything specifically on this. And you'll see, I think, when we're done, what a wonderful pattern it follows through the Scripture. Acts 13, Paul is at Antioch at Pisidia. He preaches in the synagogues. The, the, the Jews, the Pharisees oppose him. The Gentiles want to hear him. And so the Pharisees try to badmouth, I hate to use that kind of term, but that's what they were trying to do, Paul. 
And then the Gentiles said, the Gentiles said, we want to hear you again next Sabbath. He preaches and he makes that statement to the Jews, to the Pharisees. He says, seeing you count yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, from henceforth we turn to the Gentiles. And then he says, for so hath the Lord commanded us, and my, here's my text, the 48th verse, my beginning text. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad. And they glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And before we're through this morning, you're going to be part of the as many as is. As many as. Now, when you read that, the very grammatical structure of that verse says something that most preachers, I'm sorry to say, pass over. When you say as many as, you make a distinction of a group that are separated from the whole. I'm going to repeat that. Whenever you say as many as, you have made a division between that group and the whole. So there is a division in the world today of a group that are distinct and separate from the whole. So he says here, and when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as, and we'll just keep that in mind because we're going to find them several places this morning, as many as were ordained to eternal life believe. Now that word, I'm not going, I'm not going into Greek. Because when I used to study Greek, it was all Greek to me. <laughs> but that word means to be, to be assigned, to be appointed. In 2 Thessalonians, the apostle Paul says, But we're bound to give thanks unto God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. For God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification and belief of the truth. So we, we go, everybody in here that's a believer should know uh, Ephesians 1, 4. According as he has chosen us in Christ before, the, before there were stars, before this world was formed, before there was any strata, before all that in the eternal purpose of God, he chose a people and they are called in Scripture the elect believers and so on, I'm calling them this morning the as many as. Turn there just a minute. I want to show you something. Why those, uh, Ephesians, the first chapter, and then this, I want to go to the second chapter just for a verse. These people are chosen, and notice it says that in my text, they were glad. And when they heard this, they were, those people were glad. Why? Because, listen to Ephesians 2.12, when Paul is talking there about the Gentile world, he says that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. The Gentile world, up till the new covenant came into being, were without hope. I can't think of much of anything that is more desperate than no hope. No hope. They perished. And now Paul says, those promises now are yours, that you've been incorporated. I'm telling you, if that wouldn't make you glad, there's something wrong. And then when you're that glad, you know what they did? <coughs> they glorified the word of the Lord. Well, we need to move on. I only, I only have an hour and 45, 50 minutes of material <laughs> for the first service. <laughs> 
Now I'm going to show you, I'm, uh, listen, I'm going to give you the references. I, I quote most of this. I've, I've memorized it. The Lord's blessed me to be able to memorize it. But in John 17, which is the Lord's high priestly prayer, there's something vital in that opening part. If you want to turn there to, to follow me, John 17, the first uh, couple of verses, it says, Jesus spake these words and lifted up his eyes. And here's what he said. He said, Father, now, don't miss it. Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power or authority over all flesh, that he should, not might, that he should give eternal life to that same group. What? Read it out loud. As many as. Now, notice, the Lord said, Father, Glorify me, the hours come, as thou hast, this is so important, as thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And it goes on to say, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast said. When we read that, that God the Father gave him a people, we can now come to the doctrine of the everlasting covenant. And I'm telling you what, in my travels and over the years, I have talked to dozens dozens of believers and I've talked to preachers that have never heard a sermon on the everlasting covenant. Paul talks about it, the blood of the everlasting covenant. There is a covenant in which God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit in eternity past entered into a covenant agreement whereby God the Father chose a people, he gave those people to his son. His son came and humbled himself and took upon him the form of a servant, was willing to die, predestinated to die, that he might redeem those. And so the father <coughs> gives them to the son. The son comes into the world he goes to fulfills the law of God perfectly. Not one jot or tittle is missed. And then he goes to the cross. And on that cross, he pays the sin debt for everyone that the Father gave him. And then bless the Lord. He doesn't do anything singularly in that area. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are all involved. And the Holy Spirit knows everyone that's in that covenant of grace. He knows where all the as many as are. And in the due course of time, the Spirit moves through the world. I'm telling you from the farthest, most remote, right to Redding, California and other places, and he knows he knows where every one of those elect are, and he comes to them, and he regenerates them. David said, listen, about that covenant. Though my house be not so as it ought, yet hath the Lord made with me an everlasting covenant ordered in all things and sure. And this is all my salvation. And neither doth he make it to grow. The old confessions used to say that that company, as many as elect or whoever you want to call them, that they were given to Christ and that number could neither be added to nor diminished. Every person in that covenant of grace is, comes under the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and are quickened by the Spirit of God. And I better move on or I'll start preaching. In John 1, 12, it says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But, good conjunction, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But to who? As many as received him. 
there they are again. A body distinct from the whole. But to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even them which believe on his name. Here's the key. I had a man come to me one time, was going to straighten out. He was in the church, been there a short time. He was going to straighten out my soteriology, which is the doctrine of salvation. And he quoted that to me to prove that, you know, that my doctrine of particular redemption was not. And I said to him, he quoted, and I said, well, quote 13. He said, what? I said, quote 13. He said, I'm not sure I know 13. I said, well, it's the commentary on 12. He came unto his own, his own received him not, but to as many as received him, to them he gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them which believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. They were born of God. In John 3, 16, or John 3, the Lord said, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and you hear the sound thereof, but you cannot tell whence it cometh or whether it went. So, underline that word, S-O, that is the way that every one of the elect is quickened by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God supernaturally, He seeks them out, and He comes to them, and He regenerates those people. They're born of God. Men are dead in trespass and sins. And my old friend Henry Mahan said they're graveyard dead. And a dead man can't do anything. He's inanimate. I was out at the cemetery the first time I've been there since I buried my wife, Millville. My mother and father... My brother, two of my brothers, some of my nephews are there, some dear friends are there. I saw all the gravestones. I have neither the desire nor the ability to bring them out of that grave. They're dead. Their bodies are deteriorating. Man in his natural state state is altogether vanity. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, for they're spiritually discerned. So here is a man who is dead spiritually. He has no inclination toward God. He has no ability to move toward God until something happens. In Ephesians, the first chapter, we get the clue to it. It says this, and what is the exceeding, boy, I like that word, what is the exceeding greatness of the power of God? What is the exceeding greatness of the power of God? Follow me as you look at it. Ephesians 1 and 19. Wonderful word, us word. What is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and set him in his own right hand in heavenly places. It took the same power of God to quicken a dead son of Adam, as it did to raise Christ from the dead. It, it, <clears throat> this has got nothing to do with the message, but write it down and put it up here. Everything in regard to God's spiritual kingdom is supernatural. Amen? You're not sure, but yes. It's supernatural. Man is dead, and it says, What is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power? If God by his Holy Spirit had not quickened me, I'd have gone to hell deaf, dumb, and unconcerned. And so he quickened me 
by the same power. That's glorious. It took the power of God. He was three days and three nights in that tomb, and the power of God brought him out of that, and we preach the wonderful doctrine of the resurrection. He just goes on and says that, that he might set him in his own right, at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And he goes on and says a wonderful thing. So when we realize, when you realize that you were wandering through life dead in trespasses and sin and unconcerned and lost and hell-bound, and God, because he gave you to Christ, sends his Holy Spirit and quickens you. And all of a sudden, the gospel, there was a puzzle to you if you ever read it, all of a sudden it unfolds. Who has saved us and called us? Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace in Christ Jesus. And then Paul goes on and says, where unto he called you by our gospel? I've, I've got to move. Go to... This is... This is one of my favorite on the day of Pentecost, Peter's preaching. And he says, this promise, these promises that I'm preaching are to you and to your children and to all that are afar off. Here they are. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So in the whole world, as scattered as it could be, there were some of the as many as, and God calls them first by His Spirit, and then He calls them by the preaching of the Word. <clears throat> you see, there are, there are two calls. In John 5, the Lord said, The hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. That is spiritual life there when he calls us to spiritual life then later on he says when all those in the grave which is of no issue with us this morning so God calls a man first of all in regeneration but then there's the call of the gospel there's a call my dad used to love this he was an old sinner there's a call comes ringing or the restless waves send the light what was the light preaching of the gospel I tell you when you have realized what God did, all of a sudden the gospel, the gospel of the grace of God becomes precious. I've been preaching it for almost 60 years. <laughs> I love it. And you know, I was telling my grandson Seth, I have never had the cruise of oil go dry. And I've never reached down into the barrel when there wasn't some meal there. God is faithful. We sing that story. I love to tell the story. Because we do. Because it's the song of our redemption. What he's done for us. Well, I, I shy on this one a little. Because in Romans eight fourteen he said, As many as, here they are again, as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. And to the shame of the churches today and believers today, I've talked to dozens and dozens over the years, they don't know what it means to be led of the Spirit. And when you don't know what it is to be led of the Spirit, you revert to the law. Turn to Galatians just a minute. In 5 and 16, he says, But if ye be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. <clears throat> Churches that are not led, believers that are not led by the Spirit, and I better be careful how I'm saying this, usually revert to law works. Do's and don'ts and do's and don'ts. He says there, Verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Walking, he says there in Romans that the gospel was preached 
for the obedience of faith. So we walk by faith. We walk according to the word, the written word. We walk according. You want to preach uh, People used to say to me, oh, brother, I wish I knew the will of God. They're looking for some mysterious, nebulous thing floating out there. I just used to say, well, just get your Bible and find every reference to the will of God and try to do those and then see how you make out from there. We are led by the Spirit when we pray. When I prayed for this preaching this morning, I prayed, Lord, like Moses, if you don't go with me, I don't want to go. It's a tremendous responsibility. But I pray, Lord, lead me. Lead me in my thoughts. Lead me in the utterance of my words. Lead me. And that's how we ought to walk, by faith, being led of the Spirit. Got to go to this one, and I think it's the best one. You don't need to turn there, but in Revelation 3 and 19, the Lord Jesus himself says, and he opens the statement by identifying the group. He said, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. I heard, I heard a man on the radio, he was supposed to be a preacher, and he said, God doesn't chasten us. We chasten ourselves. My Bible says God chastens us. So, let me read you. I, I love this. I've memorized this chapter. But let me read you just 5 and 6 of Hebrews 12. If you have your Bible open, you can read it with me. Hebrews 12, 5 and 6. <clears throat> he's admonishing them, and he says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation of, which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither faint nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. I'm going to stop there for a minute. He said, my son, don't despise it. I just read something that recently by my, probably my favorite old time preacher, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And he dealt with this chastening, that it is necessary for our life. And I'm going to show you that. It is necessary for the child of God. If you had, because he talks about our earthly fathers, we had to chastise our children. When they did wrong, they were corrected, and sometimes they had to get a little warm on the posterior. But <coughs> they had to be chastened. And he's going to show us here, look, and go on with me. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and endureth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? And he said, if you are without chastisement, you're an illegitimate child. You're not real. So chastening has to be part, and I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to show you the proof, and then I'm going to show you the blessing, and then I'm going to quit. Nine, furthermore, we've had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit. God chastens us for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. He says, be ye holy as I am holy. We are admonished, exhorted, commanded to be holy in all our deportment of life. And he says he does it 
for our profit that we might be partakers of His holiness. What a glorious thing that God cares for His children enough to apply the rod to make them walk, to convict them, to walk orderly, to walk according to His Word, to walk being led of the Spirit. God uses chastisement even though we don't like it and we might moan and kick against the pricks, but God does it what? For our profit that we might be partakers <coughs> of His holiness. Verse 14, here's the blessing of the chastisement. Follow peace with all men and holiness let those words soak in, without which no man, no man shall see the Lord. Do you live an unholy life? Paul says you're not going to see the Lord. So we're exhorted to live holy and godly in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the blessing that he chastens us, that we are partakers of his holiness without which we will not see him. So, uh, as many as were ordained to eternal life, the as many as were in the covenant of grace, the as many as were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or the will of man, the as many as were called first by the Spirit and then by the gospel, the as many as are led by the Spirit and the as many as are chastened by the Lord that we might walk in holiness well-pleasing unto Him. The summation of that, the summation of those words, as many as, is the essence and the expression of the doctrine of election. Those are some of the most powerful words to substantiate the doctrine of election. Mr. Spurgeon said, all of grace from base to summit. Grace on every step and the stone. Grace, redeeming, saving, keeping. Sovereign grace and grace alone. Marvelous grace, mercy, and grace that is poured out upon as many as. So this morning you've been introduced to become in your mind and understanding now, one of the as many as is. Amen. I'm going to pray. Father, we bless you today. Lord, I give thanks. Lord, for this good spirit present in this place. Bless each one of these children of yours for the hearing of the word and the implanting of that word in their heart and mind. We thank you, Lord, for this occasion, this hour, where we again revel in our mind and in our spirit and in our soul for your mercy and grace and love to us in Christ Jesus. For the two pastors, bless them in their situations and bless this little congregation to continue on and to be a witness of your sovereign grace. Lord, we bless you in Jesus' name.